Uri is very well known for creating an assortment of RPG Maker horror games, most prominently for the Strange Men Anthology. I've played through the first three of those games and I loved them. The stories were incredible and I've yet to find a single RPG Maker game with a better art style for all the character sprites and environments. But that doesn't mean all of her games have been great. Uri started out with a game called Insanity, but I won't be playing that one today. In the words of the translator VG person, the Crooked Man was a game. Insanity struggles to make it to game. It's a flimsy container for a story and a strangely paced one at that. When the official translator of your games refuses to translate one of them, it's probably a pretty bad game. So instead, I played Paranoiac, Uri's second game. I went in knowing next to nothing. I just checked it out on a whim at the suggestion of my friend Andrew. Maybe if I had done a little bit more research, I would have learned that the translator had some less than kind words for this game too. But I guess hindsight is 2020. For now, let's get into it. The game follows Miki Takamura, a 25-year-old author whose aunt died about three years ago. For reasons yet to be revealed, Miki is moving into this aunt's old house. It has been severely neglected over the years. It's covered in a blanket of dust, and there's rotting food in the fridge. Miki's mother claims that she came by the house to clean up once or twice after the death, but upon seeing the state it's in, that's clearly untrue. The character profiles are great looking. I'm playing the remake of the game, which has lovely side profiles of each character during dialogue. Compared to this, the sprite work is just okay. Maybe it's because I'm used to the Strange Men anthology, but the assets here feel underwhelming. Everything is muted and feels less cohesive than Uri's later works, but it's by no means bad. Miki explores her new home, quickly realizing that the majority of the doors are securely locked. The phone in the kitchen rings. It's Miki's mother who claims that her luggage will be arriving tomorrow. Miki asks about the locked doors, learning that Aunt Saiki had a severe persecution complex and would keep everything under lock and key. Miki's mother is pretty aggressive towards Saiki, repeatedly calling her stupid and generally looking down on her posthumously. She tells Miki to figure it out herself before hanging up. Miki takes a shower and heads upstairs to get ready for bed. She doesn't stay asleep for long, quickly being jolted awake by a nightmare. Miki realizes that she forgot to take her pills, so she heads off to the kitchen to take them with some water. She turns on the kitchen faucet, but alongside the water, human hair starts to pour from the drain. Miki gives up for now, resolving to call a plumber tomorrow and just get some sleep. But then a creak emanates from down the hallway, behind the locked door to the study. At least, it used to be locked. It's currently wide open, although nothing unusual is inside. There's a large stain in the center of the rug, but that's about it. On the bookshelf, Miki finds a book about color psychology and how different colors can cultivate certain emotions, the contents of which she notes down for later. She decides to head back to her room, but before she can do so, a static-filled shadowy creature emerges from behind her in the study, initiating a chase scene. It took my friends and I a while to figure out what the heck was happening during these sequences because it's quite poorly put together. Each night, Miki is attacked by these shadow creatures. As she runs away, pink arrows will occasionally appear, pointing to the places where she can hide. The first time these arrows appear during this chase, only one is visible. So obviously you follow the arrow, right? What you're supposed to do is search around the house for more and more pink arrows, trying each and every one through the process of elimination until you find the correct one. Now this could have absolutely been a great section for the tutorial. Miki learns that not every hiding spot is safe and she needs to try and find a different one. However, the game doesn't really tell you this. There's no text box or anything saying, uh oh, I better find another hiding spot. You just see a big arrow, follow it, then take damage. Because of this, I immediately stopped trusting the arrows. Following them got me hurt last time, right? There are no clues or indicators on where you should be hiding. It's entirely up to chance. These chase scenes are just trial and error. That's it, there's no skill to it, which just really takes the fun out of it for me. On night one, the correct hiding spot is underneath the kotatsu. As soon as Miki hides underneath it, she falls fast asleep. By morning, the monsters are completely gone. Miki is obviously worried about what happened, but she can't tell if it was a dream or not. It felt real, and she woke up underneath the katatsu, but Miki is doubtful that something like that could ever have really happened. A plumber arrives to check the pipes for abnormalities, but he has no clue where the hair could have come from, assuming that it must have just been some kind of gunk buildup over the course of the last three years. Miki examines the study to see if there are any signs of the creature, finding nothing out of the ordinary. Except a book falls from the shelf with a loose sheet of paper inside 
inside documenting a safe combination. When you try to use it on the safe in the living room, Miki claims that she doesn't know the combination, even though she literally just picked it up. Later on, you get some information that allows you to translate the code into numbers for the safe, so I assume the creator just didn't realize that a keypad in this format is frequently used to input both numbers and letters. Miki finds an unlocked room containing a computer with a crumpled up piece of paper in the trash can reading beautiful things are fake. Beauty is only there to hide something. Setting aside the devastating cynicism behind that message, Miki realizes that this is related to a flower in the backyard. But before she can make it all the way outside, she gets a phone call from her assistant, Hayakawa. He's checking in on her health, as well as letting her know that he plans to fax over the binding for her new book tonight so she can review it. It seems that Miki's being forced to write romance novels that she has absolutely no interest in. As if things couldn't get any worse, whatever illness she has is preventing her from writing. Finally able to get to the backyard, Miki eyes a lone flower in the grass. It's the only thing in the entire house that she can truly consider beautiful, and upon further examination, she realizes that it's fake. Miki digs underneath it, unearthing a key. Maybe her aunt buried it there due to her persecution complex. Miki can ponder this later, as someone is ringing her doorbell. Seems that the mailman delivered Miki's packages across the street to a man named Shinji Miura. The two make quick work of the stack of packages, and she offers him some tea as a thank you. Most of us in the voice call didn't really bat an eye at Shinji's kindness, but my friend Kenny was completely convinced that this man was out to do evil. No, I don't trust him. He's gonna betray us. He's behind the shadow monsters. He says he hates your name. Dude, that's just how you know someone is f***ed in the head. They have a short chat over tea where Shinji is beyond impressed that Miki manages to make a living as an author. He's shocked to find out that Miki is Saiki's niece, as they aren't anything alike. Saiki would frequently let out blood-curdling screams and haphazardly stumble around in the middle of the night. Honestly, I'm not all that surprised. Just look at the tea she had stocked. That's not gonna help her relax. Thankfully for Miki, this video has been sponsored by Gamersups, who recently released some tea of their own. It's a brand new product that they were kind enough to send me so I could try it out, and honestly, I'm happy to say that I really liked it. I live up in the mountains where it's super cold during the winter, so having tea as an option is awesome for this time of year when I need that extra warmth. They even have some caffeine-free flavors like Sleepy Time, which can help you relax and get to bed easier, especially for people like me who frequently stay up till 3am getting work done. If you're not a tea person, Gamersups is widely known for their wide selection of differently flavored energy supplements, from normal stuff like this to this. I have to admit, this is a guilty pleasure, best flavor. It has a ton of essential vitamins, it's way healthier than most other drinks like this, and it has zero calories. If you're still on the fence, you can use code BEN again to get 10% off your order and support the channel at the same time. Damn it. Not again. Yeah? Did I hear y'all dishing my tea? <sighs> You've gotta be- No. No you did not. I tell you what, if I hear you talking smack about my tea again, I'll walk on in there and stick a foot up your- Hey, man, we try and keep it PG-13 here, please. Wait, is that a mask? N nah. Gino? <sighs> Use code BEN again at checkout for 10% off. Now, Gino, get your ass over here! <laughs> With their conversation over, Shinji heads out, revealing that he's currently on paid leave for an inflamed tendon, but he just helped Miki with a ton of manual labor. Dude, this guy is bad news. You picked a box that, with an inflamed no, tendon. That, yeah, dude? that's that's uh, that's bull. No, he has an inflamed tendon and he's picking up boxes. This dude's totally, totally bad news. After a long day of cleaning, Miki wakes up in the middle of the night to the ring of her phone. She heads to the kitchen to pick it up, and sure enough, it's Hayakawa. Miki reaches for the phone to chew him out for calling so late when the screech of dial-up begins to grow louder and louder. Hair begins to pour from the fax machine beneath the phone. A static demon materializes and initiates another chase. This time, the correct hiding spot is in the computer room in a dresser. Miki is coming to terms with the fact that this isn't a dream, but she doesn't know what to do. She she doesn't have any other place to stay, and her mother isn't exactly a supportive person. She looks around the house, finding that the garden key goes to a room with a large vanity mirror. There's a note taped to the glass reading, Silence, Happiness, Peace. I see them all in a row, but it's happiness I can't have. I try to wear it, but it's hollow. This puzzle is fairly simple. Remember the book about color psychology? You have to match the three words at the top with the three articles of clothing in the wardrobe. The note draws attention to happiness, which is yellow, so Miki takes a closer look, finding a key. 
This would be an awesome puzzle if it wasn't easier to accidentally solve than to intentionally solve. Most players try all options available to them to gather information before solving a puzzle. If you examine the shirts just to see what each one says, you win. No puzzle needed. The shirt key unlocks a room with a grand piano inside. There's sheet music sitting atop it that Minky recognizes as something that Aunt Saiki used to play for her. She tries playing it herself, eventually noticing yet another key on the wires. I am getting really sick of these keys. I know that the doors have to be locked in a reversible way so that Miki can unlock more of the house as the game goes on, but this is the most bland way to do it. I think it would have been a lot more interesting if the keys had unique names or sprites. Maybe some could be brass, some aluminum, some covered in rust, some heavily scratched, just something to differentiate them. Miki hears a knock at her front door. Is it Shinji again? Oh, it's gonna be him with a gun, dude. He's gone insane. It's Miura, and he brought over some fresh pears. He comments that Miki looks quite pale, prompting her to claim that she just hasn't been sleeping well. Miura offers to lend an ear whenever Miki needs one before heading out. That night, Miki resolves to stay awake the entire night. As she paces around, music begins to play from inside the piano room. Nobody appears to be inside until the static hand of a monster reaches out from beneath the piano, grabbing Miki's leg and pulling. This is a quick time event fairly similar to what we saw in The Crooked Man. It's not outright bad or anything, it's just boring and unneeded. Miki runs for her life, this time hiding in the bathroom until morning. She calls her mother for reassurance, instead getting laughed at and ridiculed for being insane and acting like a child. She calls Miki an idiot before telling her to figure it out herself and hanging up. This woman is the scum of the earth. I already had a heavy distaste for her when she was talking poorly about her dead sister. She kept looking down on Sayaki for not being fully mentally stable. Then the second her own daughter shows signs of needing help, she just abandons her. I'd like to say it's unrealistic to have this evil of a person exist, but that just wouldn't be true. Miki uses the key from the piano to unlock the door to another room, presumably one belonging to her uncle. There's another note inside. In the darkness, shine the light and find the shadow. My my light has gone out. To solve this puzzle, all you have to do is turn on the lamp and turn off the overhead light to spot the silhouette of yet another goddamn key in the lampshade. As she grabs it, the phone rings from downstairs. It's Hayakawa seeking approval on his binding proposal, which Miki gives. He asks how the next book is going, and Miki admits that she has yet to even begin. The assistant wishes her well before leaving her to get some rest. That night, Miki desperately tries to write something for her book. The ideas have come to a halt, and she can't get anything out, so she decides to head to the convenience store to get some drinks. On the way back, home, she breaks down. That house isn't her home. She hates it. It's dangerous, she can't go to sleep, and she's constantly in a state of anxiety every second that she's there. She doesn't want to go back. Miki resolves to spend the night outside, sleeping on a bench. Maybe if she stays there till morning, the monsters won't come. She's only been attacked in her new home, after all. Unfortunately, this theory turns out to be false. Miki is attacked by the same creature as always, initiating the worst section of the game by far. Instead of looking for hiding places in her house, Miki is sprinting through the town. It's the same exact trial and error nonsense at a much larger scale, where you have to weave through alleyways and roads trying to figure out the singular path that doesn't spawn any creatures. If you choose the wrong horizontal road, you'll still have enough time to backtrack before the creature that spawns can get you. If you do it on a vertical road, you're basically guaranteed to be dead. The creature essentially spawns on top of you, and it's a one-shot kill this time. It's a tedious mess that took way longer to complete than it should have. Miki arrives at the police station where she claims that she's being chased. The police help her calm down and call Miura to come pick her up in the morning. Miki apologizes to Miura for all the trouble, but he claims it's no worry at all. He's just happy to feel useful for once. The police suddenly came to my place, so I thought I'd done something. You were scared! Dude, you were scared! Would you not be worried if the police showed up at your door? No, because I have nothing to hide. Kenny shoving his sword in the closet. What murder? Miki doesn't want to be alone, so Miura invites her to breakfast, but she doesn't want to take any more of his time and heads home. Back inside, she unlocks a bedroom with two beds. Underneath the covers of one is a doll. Finally, an item other than... Never mind, there's a key inside of it. Miki uses her five billionth key to unlock a nursery that's been torn to pieces. There's a chart on the wall that can be used to convert the safe password from earlier into numbers so that it can finally be input. Miki does so, discovering yet another freaking note. When you gaze into the abyss, the abyss also gazes into you. Surely it's me who's in the abyss. The only thing even remotely like an abyss in this game is the well in the backyard, so Miki grabs a flashlight and leans down to check it out. There's another freaking key fastened to the wall, but she can't quite reach it. As soon as she clasps her hands around it, she loses her balance and falls in. 
There's a tear in the wall like some kind of fabric. It's the only real way to go, so Miki investigates. There's a single linear tunnel, and since another creature just spawned behind her, she has plenty of motivation to follow it. She stumbles through the tunnel, eventually finding water at the end and splashing through it in a desperate attempt to escape. She manages to get to the wall where a larger tear than earlier has appeared, but as she clambers through it, she finds herself back at the bottom of the well. She collapses from exhaustion, only waking at the sound of Miura ringing the doorbell to check in on her. Miki begins to scream for help, and thankfully he hears her, grabbing a rope to get her out. Miki breaks down once again, sobbing and explaining everything to her neighbor. While he doesn't believe that there's a monster, he trusts that she He's telling him the truth. He wants to help, even if that means convincing her to seek mental help for hallucinations. Miura lets Miki know that she's completely welcome to stay at his apartment tonight and that he'll look around the house to make sure that no one is there. If anything pops out, I'll strike it down. I'll strike it down. Frickin' weeb. <laughs> Did you call him a weeb? He's a fucking serial killer. Who else says strike it down? Serial killers, they do. I'll strike it down with my Chidori. Strike it down with my fucking 12 gauge. Back at Miura's apartment, they talk about about Miki's illness. She was recently diagnosed with depression. While she doesn't know if her aunt experienced the same thing, she does know that Saiki ended her own life. Saiki married about 10 years ago, moving into that house. Three years later, she and her husband had a child on the way, but it was stillborn, and Saiki seemed to blame herself. Her husband eventually gave up on her, filing for divorce and leaving her alone. That's when the hallucinations started. She claimed she was always being watched. Miki believes that she and her mother should have been there for Saeki, but her mother has severe hysteria and has always had something against her little sister. When Saeki came to her for help, the mother called her crazy and a murderer. She cut her out of her life entirely. Miki was so scared of her own mother that she didn't have the courage to help. Three years ago, Miki couldn't take it anymore. She wanted to check in on her aunt, leaving by herself to go to the home and spend time with her. That's when she found the body. The reason Miki was sent to live at Saeki's house was because of her diagnosis. When her mom found out, she told her to move there because it was a good house for crazies. Miki claims that her mom isn't a bad person and that what she says isn't wrong, but the sheer eruption of emotion and anger in the voice call that I was in during this entire interaction says otherwise. Miura tries to talk some sense into her, but she seems set in her misguided thought process. Miura heads off to check Miki's house for monsters, as he promised. In the meantime, she gets some sleep. She has a terrible nightmare about the night that she discovered her aunt's body, jolting awake in her own bed. Did Miura bring her back here in her sleep? He wouldn't do that. Uh-huh, mister, no. he's a serial killer. Okay, I'm, I'm warming up to Mira. I still think he's a serial killer, but maybe he's a nice serial killer. He'll politely stab you to death. Yeah. Miki sprints to the door, but is cut off by another static monster. I'd like to note that I died during this chase in a single hit when nothing was in the room. Even when I go frame by frame, nothing was there. Miki hides inside of a closet, finding yet another freaking key on the floor. It's the one from inside the well, which she appears to have dropped during the chase. This key unlocks the final door, leading to a small room full of stuffed animals. She leaves, then re-enters because reasons. One of the toys has now fallen over, revealing the code to the computer written on the wall behind it. The computer has an assortment of diaries entries on it, documenting Saeki's spiral into madness. We learn that Miki's mother is even more of a bitch than we thought, accusing her sister of having children only so her husband wouldn't leave her. We learn of her delusions, finding that Saeki was seeing all of her family members telling her that she should die, Miki included. Miki starts to think back about how little she knows about her aunt. She doesn't even remember what her face looks like. All she can remember is the hanging body. Where did the memories go? Why can't she remember? She only knows some basic information. Saeki liked to sew, play piano, and read. She was a kind person. But she should know more than that, shouldn't she? Where are the real memories? All she can recall is secondhand information. The doorbell rings. It's Miura. Miki berates him for bringing her back to this horrible place, tearing into the man with everything she has. But Miura didn't bring her back here. He checked the house for monsters, found nothing, then went back to his apartment to get some sleep. Miki woke in the middle of the night, telling Miura that she would be fine before heading back across the street, despite his protests. Miura decides to be brutally honest. He believes that Miki is telling him the truth, but not that there is a monster. If she was being chased every single night, wouldn't there be traces of it, yet nothing was left behind. He even climbed down into the well, finding no cave, no tear in the wall. 
He believes that Miki is hallucinating. Sayaki's illness came from the guilt surrounding the death of her child. What if the same is happening to Miki for the guilt of not saving her aunt? For her own safety, Miura thinks she should go to the hospital. Miki is resistant, telling Miura to leave. But he stops, asking her what she truly believes. Is there really a monster, or is it just a delusion? This is where the game branches into two paths, with a different ending for each choice you make. First, we're gonna say that it's all a delusion, netting us the bad ending. Miki admits that Miura has a point. There's no way this is anything but a delusion, right? She plans to go to the hospital tomorrow, and Miura promises to come running if she needs anything. Miki goes to the sink to take her antidepressants, only to realize that she's completely out. Instead of going to the hospital right away, she chooses to tough it out one final night. The phone rings, with her mother on the other side of the phone. She asks if everything is sorted out, and Miki lies through her teeth saying there's no problem. She knows that if she were to tell her mom that she's hallucinating, she would only be berated, just like her aunt. We cut to nighttime. Miki is slumped against the wall when she hears crying. But that crying can't be real. Everything has been a delusion so far, right? She goes to investigate, to prove to herself that nothing is wrong. The noise is coming from the study. She pushes the door open, finding the static monster, her aunt, suspended from the ceiling like the day that Miki found her. Miki starts to break down, just like Sayaki did all those years ago. She blames herself for Aunt Sayaki's death. She killed her. She is the one responsible for her death. It was all her fault. Sayaki falls from the ceiling, reaching for Miki. The body was found the next day, covered from head to toe in wounds. Mira was the one who found the body, and he's still heavily in grief. So many wounds. She couldn't have done that herself, right? What if it was a monster? No, there's no way that that's possible. It was self-inflicted, just like the newspaper said. But that just makes Mira blame himself even more. If he had just shown more concern for Miki, she wouldn't be dead right now. It's all his fault. He killed her. A static monster flickers into existence behind him before quickly vanishing. The credits roll. I adore this ending. Even upon rewatching the footage to write this script, I got tingles. Watching Miki fall into the same pit of delusion from blaming herself for something that wasn't her fault was just heartbreaking. And seeing the same thing happen to Miura added this extra layer of terror and despair. We now know what circumstances cause these monsters to appear, and we know that Miura is gonna be the next victim. But things don't have to be this way. The game has two endings, after all. This time, we're going to choose to believe that there really is a monster. Miki stands firm. There's no way in hell the things she's been seeing and experiencing can be just her imagination. It's not some delusion, everything has to be real. She kicks Miura out of the house, taking her pills that didn't run out this time for some reason. Her mother calls, and Miki decides to confide in her. This absolute <laughs> degenerate scumbag laughs at her daughter and makes fun of her before hanging up. What a <clears throat> Things go exactly like last time. Miki hides in her room, hears crying, then investigates the study to find her aunt. But this time, when Saiki reaches for Miki, she runs. The monster chases her, but this time she hides in the room full of plush toys. Saiki steps inside, stopping before attacking. Miki dropped her flashlight, and the beam has fallen onto a toy bear with her name sewn on the foot. A memory enters Miki's head. Her mother, who we finally learn is named Minako, is being an absolute bad, uh, unagreeable person, per usual, while talking to her sister. Minako heads out for a night shift at work, tossing some money to Miki for dinner and ignoring everything her daughter says. Miki enters the living room, finding Saiki there wearing a kind smile. Saiki's pregnant and considering making some plush toys for her new child. She's worried that if it's a boy, he won't like a stuffed animal, but Miki assures her that anyone would love a gift like that from a parent. Sayaki offers to make one for Miki as well, although Miki is worried that her mother will be annoyed by this. Sayaki promises to talk to Minako, saying that there's nothing wrong with giving a gift to someone that she truly cares about. Back in the present, this new information weighs on Miki. That toy was a gift for her, and she never got it because Sayaki ended things. Miki begins to cry, profusely apologizing to the shadow for not being there as much as she could have and for being too scared of her mother to change that fact. We learn that Miki became a writer because of her aunt's love for books. Saiki begins to cry too. The two share an emotional moment before Miki wakes up on the floor. Miura is there by her side. He went to check on her, but she didn't reply, so he went inside and found her on the floor, unresponsive to any attempts to wake her. He even called an ambulance. Miki's tears of sadness have turned to those of joy. She remembers everything now. She had someone who loved her, 
and she loved them back, and that's all the hope that she needed. Miki is taken to a psychosomatic doctor who tells her that they believe she has schizophrenia. After an unknown period of time, Miki returned to Saeki's home to gather her things. She needs to move back in with her mother, since that home is far closer to a hospital where she can get the treatment that she needs. Miura is worried for her. Her home situation sounds difficult, and he doesn't want things to get worse for her. Miki plans to make her mother get counseling for her hysteria. Despite everything that's happened, she still cares about her. She promises Miura that she will return as soon as she can, much to Miura's delight. Okay, is there so, a second version of this game where he becomes a murderer? No. Why are you so just dead he, set on him being him. a murderer? I don't trust him. Alright, that's fine. You cannot trust him, and we'll just be over here happily ever after, I guess. And you'll you be over there, scheming stuff. in the corner. I'll be frank. I don't know nearly enough about depression to say if Uri did it any justice in this story, but I can admit that this story is incredibly engaging. It's an interesting dive into the psyche of a broken woman, documenting how she managed to get the help that she needed. I honestly believe that the story of this game is great from an outsider's perspective. If you want to pass judgment for yourself, the game's download page as well as the full recording of my friends and I playing through it will be linked in the description below. This story is great, even if the gameplay is severely lacking. The trial and error of each segment is an infuriating mess that breaks my immersion every single time. Thankfully, we know that Uri's future games improved upon this in every single way, creating truly wonderful experiences. If you want to see how much she's improved, I'll link my video on the Crooked Man down below as well. I promise you, learning about that game is 100% worth it. I hope to see you all again. Have a great rest of your day. We all know that I don't get here to gender norms. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Stares at thigh highs and skirt. That is now in a recording. Uh, fuck.